God, laying your majesty aside. You reach down in love to show me life. Lifted from darkness into light. Oh, King for a slave, trading your righteousness for shame. Despite all my pride and foolish ways Caught in your infinite embrace oh, And I find myself here on my knees again Caught up in grace like an avalanche Nothing compares to this love, love, love burning in my heart. I think one of the greatest tragedies of the modern culture uh, is the great brokenness uh, that runs among people, among families, among individuals and families and societies as a result. Um, and uh, the consequence of this is that many, many people, most people in some places, you could say, have no experience of authentic love or authentic mercy. And they would say that they aren't recipients of, of love. They aren't recipients of mercy. Um, and to those people, what I would say is that first and foremost, God reveals himself to be ultimately merciful. So even if we may not have the emotional capacity or may not have had the emotional capacity for recognizing mercy when it is given to us, and perhaps we've had no one in our life to give it, the first place that we begin is with an act, a willful act of trust and hope and faith in God who is mercy. That he loves us, that his heart is, is made warm and tender and compassionate, as scripture says, for us, even if we don't experience it that way. And that's where we begin. And that's where a process, I think, of, of immense healing has to unfold. I, I do think that the process of coming to know what mercy is uh, requires a healing. And that healing is really the healing of being loved. We have to ask, really, for the relationships, the friendships um, in which people love us. Um, and, and reveal to us what it means to be merciful. Because um, often I think what underlies this need for mercy is really the need to, to be in a relationship with someone, to stand in a relationship with another person who shows us it's good just because you are. That's really the origin of all mercy. We are merciful because someone is good and because our heart is moved by their goodness and the, the suffering of their goodness. Um, and so that's who we look for because it does have to be given to us by another person. We do have to experience it to know it fully, um, even though we might have to begin with, with an uh, act of faith. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart.
In situations of, of grave violence um, or, or immense injustice, genocides, the Holocaust, war, murder, rape, uh, sexual abuse, a whole list of, of tragedies uh, that we see uh, in the world today. I think there is, a, a, I think actually an authentic desire in people to protect, protect love, to protect themselves. Um, but I think where the problem begins is when people assume that the way that you protect love is by refusing mercy and refusing forgiveness, um, because that's not the reality of the way that we're built. Um, as human persons, when, when we're hurt, we're hurt in our heart. Our heart is, is this sort of depository of all of our love. We contain our love within ourselves. This is why it's so important for parents to love their children, um, because it's, we have to have healthy hearts to live our life. So much emotional disorder, so much illness, mental illness um, can, can arise because, because the children are not loved and into, into wholeness uh, when they are born. Um, so the, 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 the falsehood, the illusion, manifests itself when a person begins to think that the way that you protect your love is by not forgiving the person who has hurt it. But, that, but that's contrary to the work of our heart because what unforgiveness does is unforgiveness creates a block um, in our heart that doesn't permit that block to be filled with love in order that it might be healed. Um, and so this is where mercy almost sort of triumphs over justice, has to triumph over justice. Um, obviously, a person who, who commits a wrong ought to be punished. That's the fundamental act of justice. That's, and that's a role that belongs, I think, in many ways to the state. But as individual human persons with human hearts, uh, mercy has to triumph, always. And what that means is that we forgive. We are angry, but we do not take it upon ourselves to make right the wrong that was committed against us. Um, because we can't, uh, because our hearts were at risk and remain at risk. And the only way that our hearts can come back to that place in which they're whole is that they're loved. A and to, 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 to show revenge, um, to hurt another person as a, uh, in a desire for vengeance, it may sort of be, you know, like logically intentioned, uh, the, in the driving intention might be a return to justice. Uh, but in the end, our hearts are going to bleed even more and even more deeply. They're going to be hardened to the reality for which we were made, and that's a reality in which we have to be, we have to be loved and we have to love. Um, so mercy is, in some ways, you could say fundamental to our sanity. It's fundamental to our entire well-being um, to release those things because otherwise we carry them with us. They, they never depart from us, from our hearts, if we don't let them go. sent to heal the contrite of heart. now where mercy is very absent um, in a society in which there are no merciful people is a society in which um, everyone lives a completely individualistic life uh, a life in which we sort of will our own wholeness will our own power it's a society which completely has forgotten 
uh, dependence, the importance of dependence of human persons on each other. We are born and we need to be loved. You know, as we grow older, we need to be loved. We need to be taken care of. Um, and in the same way, when we are hurt, we need to be loved into, into, into wholeness again. Love, love is creative, but we cannot love ourselves. We have to be loved into wholeness by another person. So, so, so society without merciful people looks a lot like ours, uh, where there is, in the end, really very little authentic community. Uh, and then there's very little authentic desire for people to sacrifice for each other. In New York, um, you, you're living in a culture where thousands of people will pass by a homeless person on the street. It's a culture of people hardened completely to themselves and, and to each other. Um, so I think, I think we might imagine that a, a very sort of merciless world would be one in which there was a lot more violence. I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, I think a lot of people are hardened in such a way that they just don't have the energy uh, to, to love on one end, and they also don't have the energy for great violence on the other, but their hearts in the end are just completely withered, um, completely dead and numbed. And, and that's almost as, as grave of an evil in some ways. People just live their life cyclically. They're not growing in love, they're not deepening in love, they have not encountered full authentic freedom, full interior freedom. Um, I, d I don't know in some ways how much worse you can get. I, I, mean, I know you can. Uh, but it's a culture in which you live afraid to love other people um, and, and, and afraid that you won't receive love from the people that you encounter that as I think is, is, is a nation, a culture that knows no mercy. This idea of forgiveness is actually central to the reason why I wanted to do this project. I remember I was at a meditation retreat and I remember thinking to myself, what is the biggest question I have right now or what is the, the biggest thing I don't know how to do that, that I'm struggling with? And the, the question, the answer became, I don't know how to forgive myself. And I kept thinking, well, what about her? How can she move through and forgive herself when you do something that is, anybody in society would say, that's unforgivable. You can't do that to your child. The child's innocent and, and, and helpless. Um, and I remember in all the many hours of interviews that we had with Haley that she would say, you know, you can't forgive yourself and you can't move on. There's no moving on. But what you can do is you can continue. And there's something about the process of time. And time was actually a, a character in our play. It was a, the silent character. But everything in terms of the structure was centered around what time does. And I know it's such a cliche to say time heals everything. And that's true and not true because she says whenever she sees her picture, she'll go right back to that moment. But perhaps how we deal with it is actually a bit different because time allows us layers of experience. I think time is a liberator in a way because, because of the, it's either, it's either a liberator or it will encase us more, it will imprison us more depending on how we deal with these layers of experience. You're sent to heal the contrite of heart. In regards to, to mercy towards ourselves, forgiveness towards ourselves, I think it operates um, in the exact same way as does forgiveness of others. It's something that has to be willed. We choose uh, to say, you know, I, I forgive myself uh, for all of these things um, that I did, that I chose. I forgive myself for being affected by uh, the things that others did to me. Uh, I forgive myself for believing, for example, the things that others did to me or said about me. Uh, forgive myself for, for believing what, what it meant or what I thought it meant about me, that I am unworthy of love, that I am 
undesirable, um, that I should die. So many lies. And again, this is a place in which I think it's um, completely fundamental, uh, totally fundamental for a person to be living in union with Jesus. Um, because with regards to evil like this, um, evil that we carry, sin that we carry, the wounds of sin that we carry, the, the associations with sin that we carry, um, the images and memories, um, a lot of it can run very deep. A lot of it can run, run very deep um, and requires grace, really, in the end to overcome it. Um, requires a sort of s supernatural, spiritual healing also uh, to be able to overcome it. Um, because when, when wounds happen to us or when we sin, often what can happen is in that space in which there's now hurt or bleeding or openness in our heart, emptiness in our heart, that space will, will become filled with darkness. And it, one way that that darkness fills us is through what are called sort of interior vows. So we will lie and we will feel guilty about lying. Um, and perhaps somewhere in that process, we might come to think, I am never going to be capable of, of goodness and therefore I am not good. Um, and it's that kind of pattern of thinking that creates blocks on the level of our mind and on the level of our heart. And that's where people, I think, often will come across this like wall where they will say over and over and over again, I forgive myself, I forgive all these other people, but the block stays. Um, and the reason for that is it's because it can run, run very, very deep. It can run almost deeper than we're capable of reaching on our own. Um, and that's where, where it's so important to have God, um, so important to have a God. Um, and we begin, I think, in a very concrete way within the life of the church, at least, is, is by going to confession, because confession heals. It's a, the healing sacrament before it's called, you know, it's called the healing sacrament, the sacrament of healing before it's called anything else. Mm -hmm. Even the sacraments of penance or reconciliation, we call it the sacrament of healing. It heals. It's meant to heal. Um, and so one of the great, greatest gifts that we can give ourselves is by opening ourselves up to the mercy of God, because we know that he promises it to us and wishes to give it to us. Grace is amazing. For me, it's, it's um, God's acknowledgement of, of, I know that you're human. You know, I can't remember what psalm it is that, um, that basically says God knows that we're only dust, that he knows what we're made of, and so that there is this understanding that, yes, of course, you're, you're, going, to, you're going to mess up, you're going to fail, uh, but I'm going, to, I'm going to let you get back up, and I'm going to continue to love you as long as you continue to try. You know, there's a, you know, I was speaking with someone recently and, um, you know, who brought up the point, but we all sin, we all mess up. I'm like, yes, but with what intensity are you going after not messing up? You know, with the same vigor that I approach being perfect in a performance, do I approach that with my life, with my relationship with God, when on my day-to-day my day -day life am I approaching you know, trying to not miss the mark. When it comes to the, the scope of decisions that we make that we later regret, um, or, you know, especially decisions of a sort of immense proportion to, to create damage, things that are, are definitely irreversible. I think where, this is honestly where existentially, sort of experientially, day to day, we come across the limits of human existence. I am not persuaded that a person is capable of reconciling themselves. Uh, just, you know, just, you know, for example, someone like, you know, for a drastic example, someone like Hitler. I don't know how you go through being sort of the primary instrument of something like the Holocaust and on a purely natural level look back after and, and have the capacity of reconciling yourself to yourself on a purely natural emotional level. It's not po I don't think it's possible. I mean, if we, if we look at every single wound that has been inflicted upon us, every single wound that we have ever inflicted on another, every single sin that we have ever committed, if we actually spent the time looking at all of those things, it's too much for any human person to bear, which is why we don't think about it, which is why we run from thinking about it as far as, as, as we can, as fast as we can, and it's why we live our lives, I think, often numbed to a large extent to the wrongs that we both have done and have been done to us. I think in, with regards to reconciling, again, it's, it's ultimately and always going to be a question of God. 
because we are created and we are created weak and we are we are we are created weak as in like as in the sense that our goodness depends on and subsists in God. God is the giver of, of all good things. He's the only giver of good things. Um, and so as St. Paul says, grace is poured into earthen vessels. Um, we're, we're completely fragile. And, and so it, in some ways it should not surprise us that we're capable of such immense atrocities as we are, uh, or as the human race is, because we see it across history and into into this moment, into this history. Um, reconciliation, I think, is, is only possible, therefore, true sort of authentic, deep reconciliation is possible only with God who manages to reverse in the power of grace, in the order of grace, in the order of justice, the wrongs that have been committed, be they ours against another or another's against ourselves. Um, and grace lifts us out of that, grace sh shapes that. Um, and it is in, in God's history, in the making of God's history, in the writing of God's history, in our life, in the, in the lives of other people, that those things come to be resolved um, in a mysterious way that we will not ever fully comprehend. Mm -hmm. There are going to be moments in which a person comes across something that is entirely and completely spiritual in nature, in the sense that there are certain acts of forgiveness, including forgiveness for ourselves, like towards ourselves for decisions that we've made that are impossible without God. It's just, it has to be something that, that is taken out of us and healed in us at a depth greater than we have the capacity to reach by our own hand. Because we've been so emotionally broken, because the, the wounds of, of the decisions that we've made have twisted us so much. So it's in God and forgiving ourselves in God and letting God forgive us, cleanse us from our secret faults, our hidden faults, again, as scripture says. There's nothing that anybody who's ever done that God won't forgive. The word itself, mercy, actually comes from the Latin word misericordia, which literally means to give one's heart to one who is in misery. To intercede for God revealed through St. Faustina the divine mercy. What God is really revealing to us is that God is giving his sacred heart to us beings who are in misery. God, there's nothing that you have done that God won't forgive. I don't care of how many times you've done it. See, what happens with confession is that the evil one kind of, he gets a stuck in confession. First, the evil one's your friend. He's like, it's not a sin. Don't worry about it. You don't need to do these certain things. You've been doing it your whole life. No big deal. He gets you to commit the sin. Then, after you commit the sin, he becomes the accuser. He says, you did what? You thought of what you're doing that? Can't say that to the priest. So he gets us to commit the sin, and then he blocks us from going to confession. Guys, he's the father of lies. Shut him up. There's nothing that you, anybody has ever done that God won't forgive. I don't care how deep, how dark, how disgusting, how whatever that sin may be, God is always waiting in that confessional 
to, to be there for you, to love you, and to completely wipe you clean of all your sins. It's a beautiful story that St. Faustina shared. You know, she was having these visions with, uh, of Jesus appearing to her, and the sis- a lot of the sisters didn't believe her. And one of the sisters went up to St. Faustina and said, okay, well, if God is really appearing to you, ask, ask Jesus what my greatest sin was. And St. Faustina said, okay. So she went to, next time Jesus appeared to her, uh, she, asked, she asked Jesus, like, what was Sister So-and-So's greatest sin? And Jesus said something that's so profound and so beautiful. He said, I don't remember. Now, what is God revealing here? Of course he remembered. You know, God is, he, he's God, right? But what his point was is that sister went to confession. And the fact that she went to confession, it was completely wiped clean as if it never happened. There's nothing that you've done that God won't forgive. And I find myself here on my knees again. Caught up in grace like a 